So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I'd just like to firstly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I am situated today. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people. Um, I actually live and work on Wurundjeri land. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And also for any Aboriginal people attending today or watching the recording. Um, I'd also like to introduce our guest speaker, Stephanie Lynch, um, who's going to take us through her PhD journey, a little bit about the actual PhD itself, and uh, talk to us about some of the highlights, uh, the lowlights and the journey itself. So I'm going to hand over to Stephanie and I'll also stop sharing my screen so you can get started. Yeah, so thank you, Katie, and thank you to the library staff for um, inviting me to talk about my research and my pathway at La Trobe. Um, I think this is a very important seminar series as there are so many things that I wish that I knew back in my undergrad days or my um, previous time at La Trobe. Um, and it would have been really nice to see some of the research happening at La Trobe as well. So hopefully I can shed some light on both of those um, topics today. So before I dive into some of my research that I've done while I've been at La Trobe, I thought it would be really nice to kind of talk about how I got to where I am today. So I guess it would start as, um, I guess started with my love of animals. So you can enjoy some of the funny pictures that I have down here with um, animals. And um, my, do my dad particularly always reminds me of um, that, when I was younger, I would talk to everyone and anyone and tell them that I wanted to be a vet. So this was something that I grew up from as early as I can remember that I wanted to be a vet. Um, and throughout high school, I did um, many placements at veterinary clinics. And so it wasn't surprising that in 2014, I started my journey at La Trobe um, in a Bachelor of Animal and Veterinary Bioscience. So I won't talk too much about my undergrad experience at La Trobe, but overall, I really enjoyed um, the course. And anyone who's here today or is um, watching the recording that's also doing um, an animal and veterinary um, bachelor may agree that it doesn't always feel like it's an animal focused degree and it was quite, quite broad and I didn't always like th this aspect of it, but um, I'm gonna talk to this a little bit later about how this was actually a blessing in disguise. Um, and I wanted to just mention here that it wasn't until about third year of my undergrad that I started questioning, do I still want to be a vet? Um, did I want to even go and study veterinary medicine? Um, because I knew that it was another four years of study. Um, and then after some recent placements, I was, yeah, really wasn't sure that's what I wanted to do anymore. So I feel like this was um, definitely a really tough time. So having a dream job that I really wanted to do having spent three years studying towards this and then being not sure what I wanted to do. Um, I was quite lost and I was really unmotivated to keep studying. Um, so if I could go back and give myself some advice, um, while it's great to have some, like a, a set job in mind um, to work, work towards, that's great if you do. But if you find yourself um, not sure what you wanna do or you wanna change, it's completely okay. Um, I, I wish that I kind of kept more of an open mind um, and thought about the type of job that I wanted. So um, do I want to be indoors? Do I want to be in a team? Do I want to be in a leadership position? Um, and really thinking about what I was truly passionate about when thinking about what I want to study or where I want to go next. Something else that I wanted to point out was that I found placements very, very valuable. So even if you're... Um, course doesn't require you to do a placement I would highly recommend that you do because I think it was a really good chance to see the studies that um, you're currently undertaking implemented in the real world and also seeing those jobs that you may think is your dream job and seeing what their roles actually entail so when I was five years old and wanted to be a vet I thought that I would be cuddling animals all day long and it wasn't until I started doing those placements that I'm like maybe this isn't what the whole job entails so and it's also a good time to find out what you do and what you don't like because both of those are just as important as each other so you don't always have to do placements that you think you're going to love because you might find aspects that you do like but you'll also be able to rule out those that you don't and um, as I was just saying to Katie before we started this talk was that um, when I was preparing this talk I spoke to my brother and sister who both um, recently finished their undergrad at a different uni and I said to them I'm making this talk can you can you give me some things that you wish you knew back in um, your undergrad days or 
couple of months ago, really. And they both said the same two points that I'm about to say now. So one of them was to find a mentor. So when you finish your exams um, and your course, unfortunately, the harsh truth is that there's not going to be someone there to tell you what to do next. But finding a mentor can be that guide that helps you help, helps you determine, determine what you want to do next. So if you want a more formal mentor, um, Latrobe has a really great initiative at the moment called the Latrobe Career Ready Mentoring. So they will actually match you up with a Latrobe alumni. Um, but there are actually more informal ways that you can find a mentor. So these could be your lecturers, um, your demonstrator. Um, so most subjects will have demonstrators. And one thing that um, a lot of people don't realise is that they are usually PhD students. So they um, have recently graduated similar courses to yourself that you're currently undertaking. So they are very approachable and, um, and I guess, relatable to, to yourself. So that's a really good way to find a mentor. Um, and they can even be your peers as well. And so I guess one way to find some of these informal mentors is by networking. So I'm sure you've all heard it before that networking is something that's really good, but, and it seems easy to do, just go and talk to people, but it can be actually difficult putting into practice. So I would encourage you to talk to your demonstrators. So as I said, they're usually PhD students, they're very um, approachable. And that's actually one of my favorite things or favorite parts of demonstrating is um, hearing from the undergrad students about their passions or what they want to do next and actually finding them opportunities or people to connect to. So, um, it may seem intimidating, but that's actually something we really like doing. And um, I also bring up this um, point of networking is because, as I said, in third year, I started questioning whether this is what I wanted to do. Um, and so I started staying behind at my lectures and talking to the lecturers saying, this is the aspects of the subject that I really like. I'm not sure what I want to do next. Um, and they were actually really helpful. So it was only um, a, a five to 10 minute conversation with one of the lecturers um, that said, it sounds like you would re be really good at doing an, an honours year. So when he mentioned an honours year, I had absolutely no idea what this meant. But now being through it myself, I can tell you a little bit more about what this is. So an honours year is a one year research intensive subject. And I put subject in, um, inverted commas because it's not your typical undergrad subject. So you do not have any lectures or practicals, tutorials or exams. So that sounds amazing, right? Um, but normally you're placed into a laboratory group with a supervisor that oversees your project. Um, and you also are surrounded by other PhD masters and honor students. So it's a very supportive, um, a very su supportive place. And usually throughout this one year, you focus on one research question or one research topic for the entire year. So you usually do oral presentations, a literature review and a thesis at the end um, of your honours year. And um, another reason, oops, another reason why I say this is less of a subject and more of a job is because Throughout this year, you're more so ex expected to be there nine to five, Monday to Friday, working on this um, on this research topic that you've been given. So, the honors um, sorry, the honors thesis um, that I did was titled "Exploring Phage Therapy Against Bacteria Associated with Bovine Mastitis." So, I won't talk too much about this because I know that probably a lot of you are here to talk about the doggos but if you do ask me I would say that cows are just large extra large doggos <laughs> so I'll just break down this um, a little bit and it kind of goes into what my, how my PhD came about as well. So bovine mastitis is um, an infection of the mammary glands of cows and it's caused by bacteria. So some of the um, symptoms particularly within the cow we see are um, swollen and like inflamed udders, as you can see in this picture here, which is quite disturbing, um, as well as hardened and sore teats. So obviously this is um, not great from an animal well welfare point of view, but also on the production side, we see um, reduced milk production as well as um, the production of, of contaminated milk, as you can, like when we compare it to normal milk, to mastitis produced milk, um, it's definitely not great. So currently, so as I said, it's caused by a bacteria. Um, and so currently we treat 
mastitis by antibiotic therapy. So we've been using antibiotics both in animal and human health for over 60 years. Um, so bacteria have now evolved and the antibiotic treatments that used to work no longer work um, against a range of different diseases. And so this is known as um, antibiotic resistance. So we basically need to evolve our medicines to combat the bacterial infections. And so this is kind of the basis of my, um, my honours work and where I was focusing on phage therapy as a treatment option for mastitis. So phage therapy uses bacteriophages. So this is what um, a bacteriophage looks like. Um, and they are small good viruses that infect, replicate and kill bacteria. So, um, sorry, I got a little bit of there. Um, basically what we can do is these viruses are found wherever the bacteria is. So we can isolate these um, phages and apply them back to the infected area. So in my um, honours year, I collected milk from the infected teats of cows to isolate these viruses that go on and kill the bacteria. So it's a really um, nice mechanism, I suppose, as a new treatment option. So just as a summary of my honours year, we isolated a range of different bacteria from infected cows with mastitis. So over 10 different bacteria that may be causing the infection. We saw that there was high rates of antibiotic resistance across these bacteria. So obviously um, showing that the, back, sorry, the antibiotics that we will use to treat this infection are no longer going to work, which is why we um, tried isolating different bacteriophages again to kill this bacteria. So we isolated two different bacteriophages that were able to kill the two different bacteria. But as you can see, if we have over 10 different bacteria causing the disease, we obviously need many more bacteriophages. So this is kind of where my um, honours project kind of st stopped. Um, but I, at the end of my honours year, I realised that I absolutely loved research. It was a really nice balance between um, interacting with the animals as well as getting that lab-based research. So I decided to stay and do my PhD. So when I finished my honours in 2017, it was most common to go straight from an honours year to a PhD. Um, as of maybe a year or two ago, it's now more common to finish your honours, do a one year master's and then do your PhD. So just wanted to highlight that, that difference there. But um, a PhD, in order to obtain a PhD, um, it's usually about 3.5 to four years um, of study. It's again, very research focused. Um, again, no lectures, exams or anything like that, but you do have yearly mile milestones to check up on your progress. Um, and again, you have a, a large thesis to finish that off. Um, and some people do continue the same research from honors to masters to PhD, but as, um, as you'll see in a moment, that's not what I did, I changed changed up a little bit. So I just wanted to quickly um, put in some tips for finding a honours, masters or PhD lab or research project. So um, of course, it's really important to find a project that you absolutely love. Um, but I would almost argue that it's the people that you surround yourself with that are um, going to be the real drive or the the most beneficial, I suppose, because even if you have a good or a bad project, um, the people that are there to support you um, is really important. Um, and again, if you have a defined job and you know that you need a PhD to get to get there, great, do your PhD. But I think it would be really worth, um, before you start any extra study, looking at the job market that comes along with doing that study, because sometimes you can narrow yourself in and be overqualified or um, be steering yourself into a direction that you're not, you're not getting to where you want to be. So I think that's two of my tips that I would, if I could go back, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so on to the puppies, which is what we were all here for. So as I said, some people um, stay in their honours project and carry that all the way through their, to their PhD. But as um, I mentioned, I kind of changed direction a little bit. So still 
working on a similar concept of using bacteriophages, but instead in dogs. So I'm not sure if I shared my sound, but I was going to, I saw just into um, the previous speaker, she shared her visualizer thesis. So I thought that was a really nice way to encapsulate my research, but I might have to um, reshare with sound. <laughs> so you'll be able to hear the, and maybe someone can give me a thumbs up if they can hear it when it starts. <laughs> For most of us, dogs are a part of our family, so it can be really devastating when they get sick. Canine pyoderma is one of the most common illnesses diagnosed in dogs, which is a chronic or reoccurring skin infection resulting in redness, lesions, pain and inflammation. Canine pyoderma is predominantly caused by a bacterium known as Staphylococcus pseudintermedius. Unfortunately, we currently have few to no reliable treatment options against Staph pseudintermedius infections, and if left untreated, can be fatal. But don't worry, because this is where my PhD project comes in. By collecting a range of environmental samples to search for an alternative treatment option, I have successfully isolated multiple bacteriophages, which are small, good viruses that are naturally abundant in the environment and are able to kill specific bacteria such as Staph pseudintermedius. Next, we aim to formulate these phages into a treatment option against Staph pseudintermedius to treat canine pyoderma. A dog is the only thing on this earth that loves you more than he loves himself. So let's do all that we can to love them back. So that was just a, a quick intro into my, um, into my thesis, which is, I just love being able to reuse that because it took so long to make and it's only one minute. But um, so as the video kind of encapsulated, we have a problem, which is the bacterium that I'm working on, which is called Staphylococcus pseudintermedius. And this actually causes a range of different infections in our, um, in our companion animals, in our dogs. But the particular one that we focus on is canine pyoderma. So it's that skin infection that I mentioned um, within the video. And the problem with this is not only is it like because it's caused by bacteria and we currently use antibiotics, um, we are now seeing high rates of um, antibiotic resistant infections. So in up to 60% of cases, the antibiotics or the treatments that we were using previously are no longer working. So um, dogs are being left with these treatment, um, these infections that are pretty much untreatable, um, which is a harsh way of saying it. But that's pretty much the basis of my thesis. And um, similarly to the treatment that I was kind of exploring in my honours work, we are proposing that phage therapy would a would be a good alternative treatment for um, Staphylococcus pseudintermediates infections in our dogs. So similar, um, as I mentioned before, um, bacteriophages are the viruses that kill the bacteria. So, and we can isolate these from the environment. So um, I just had a nice picture here of, um, so here we have a plate of the bacteria that causes the skin infections in dogs. So we've isolated this from a dog. And as you can see from these little pinpricks or the zones of clearing, this is our, the phages that we've isolated, killing the bacteria. So we were able to isolate viruses that kill the bacteria. Um, and this is a nice microscopy image of them as they look super cool under the um, microscope. And importantly, the um, bacteriophages that I isolated were able to kill um, a large range of the isolates that we isolated from sick dogs. So this is just showing that it's a good treatment option and that it would be applicable um, across a range of different infections. So in order to test these treatments, um, they, they usually, they obviously don't go straight into our dogs, which is great, but normally um, these treatments are tested in mice. And so part of my project is also um, trying to work up a new animal alternative model. And so um, we have been developing a silkworm model. So um, silkworms are usually used for reptile food or just found in the, you've probably seen them in your backyard before. Um, and we have been using these as a nice model to um, test our treatments before they go into our precious pups. So just as a summary of my research, um, we currently have, oh, we, sorry, um, we have, 
a lack of treatment resolution in our dogs um, infected by Staphylococcus pseudintermediates um, due to a lack of treatment options. Um, my project aims to use bacteriophages as a novel treatment option, um, and we aim to test these within our silkworms um, as a animal alternative model. Oops. Um, so this, I guess the basis of my whole research is to try and find new um, treatment options for um, infections in dogs. So I guess I will finish up there, but I just thought I would quickly highlight again the main takeaways from my talk. So alongside my research, um, net, networking and mentors are going to be really helpful in guiding you through throughout your studies, but also after your studies. So um, if you can, um, yeah, start chatting to, as I said, your demonstrators and your lecturers, it doesn't have to be anything too um, in depth or involved. Um, and one that I always have like to remind myself of is that there is no one timeline for life. Um, not everyone's going to be on the same page, so it, there's no point in comparing yourself to everyone else around you, and it's okay to change directions, take breaks, um, and your mentors and networking can be really helpful in helping you with that. Um, again, it's okay not to know exactly what you want to do after, no matter how many times your family's going to ask you, so what are you doing after your undergrad? Just do what makes you happy and what you're passionate about and surround yourself with people that help you with those similar goals and keep you motivated. So now I'm happy to take any questions if there is any. And um, I have left my email here because I'm happy if people want to email me after when they're watching this back later. So thank you. Thanks, Steph, that's <laughs> great. I'll stop sharing so I can see. If, and if anyone's got questions, shoot away. I did have one question just about that silkworm use yeah, for yeah. testing how does that work in a sense of um you know mimicking what a dog's body would do is it very similar like is that um will you get the same results obviously they're different mechanics and different animals so how does yeah. that work <laughs> that is a very good question and one that um yeah it generally comes up when I talk about it and so yeah unfortunately it isn't a direct correlation so it is just uh, like almost a reduction model or a proof of principle, um, just seeing whether the phage is or the bacteriophage, our treatment is actually going to work in anything outside of the lab, I suppose. So yeah, it's really just to reduce um, how many animals we do, we will use in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Has anyone else got any questions? Feel free to fire away. But yeah, I'm also happy if anyone wants to email me instead. If <laughs> it can be daunting, daunting asking on the spot. <laughs> or if you're shy, you can always pop something in chat too. Yes. I'm curious about those cows. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm I'm assuming they're in considerable pain when their their udders are that inflamed. Yeah. What like so? What kind of treatment do they get, and um, what has to be taken in consideration if they're where um, drinking their milk? Yes. So I mean, that's that's the part of it. So they are in a lot of pain, um, especially when we go to milk them. So usually they're they're not milked. So I guess that's a good thing if you are going to be drinking their milk. Um, they usually when they get to that stage, they aren't milked anymore. And that I guess that's part of the problem as well from a production point of view is that unfortunately they can't just have cows sitting in their paddock not being used. So of course I would love to keep them all um, and just be a huge rescue for them all. But um yeah so that and I yeah in terms of um other treatments, yeah so we didn't because the antibiotics don't always work, that's that's the that's the issue, is that we don't always have um, available medication for them. I mean, of course we have pain, like pain relief, but um, that thankfully still works. But yeah, so that's that's why there is a lot of research in that space trying to find new medications for them. Yeah. How hard is it to move on when you know there hasn't been like a happy conclusion to your work? That is a really good point. And I think that was something that I did struggle with to start with is because you, you do spend like a fair bit of time investing yeah. time into yeah researching it. But it, I think another reason that I didn't continue on with that is because 
it was such a competitive space. Like there is a lot of research going on in using bacteriophages in mastitis. So it would have been hard to have that because for a thesis, you need a novel approach. So I think that was one thing that was helpful though, is knowing that so many other people are working on it. So I didn't, I didn't need to work, work on something else, I suppose. So, but yeah, that is, that's a really great question. And I do, I, a lot of people remarked in the chat, I love that you talked about cows like being giant dogs because <laughs> they literally are. <laughs> Very sweet. I, oh, Lizette's got a question for you. Yeah. Go ahead, Lizette. I got a question, uh, Stephanie. Uh, in what part of your uh, journey are you now? Is it your second year into your PhD or I what am... happens for you next? <laughs> yes, that's a great question. I, I thought that's where you may have been going. So I'm due to um, submit my thesis in like, I think three months um, and I think that some of the advice that I had was actually probably more so like for myself as well because I wish I had taken my advice sooner like really looking at what jobs are out there um, before you start studying an alternate like another degree or because yeah now I'm, I've got to the end and I'm just like I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going and um, I think that's hard but there it's just to keep the options open um, yeah so I, I guess maybe check back in three months, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I think that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got a question from Linda, too. So I think that'll be our last one. So thanks, Linda. Hi, Steph. Um, I was really interested in how much you wanted to be a vet when you were a kid. So I'm wondering how much animal contact time you get now with what you're currently doing. That's a really great question. Um, I definitely wish it was more. Um, I, yeah, as I said before, it, when I finished my honours, it was a nice balance between animal contact and um, research because I was actually going out on the farms and collecting the samples. But um, now in this project, it, it was only at the very start collecting some of the samples from the dogs and the rest has been in the lab. So I think um, if there is anyone that's interested in doing veterinary studies or veterinary research, you do have to um, realise that it's not always going to be, it depends on the project though, but um, in, in terms of mine, yeah, definitely don't get to see them as much as I, I hoped, but um, it's nice being on the other side, knowing that you're helping behind the scenes rather than um, actually in the clinic with them or anything like that. Yeah. So do you have your own dog then that compensates for that? I, I do. Um, so in my in that little one minute video I showed, that was my husky that I I had to feed lots of treats to be in the in the video. <laughs> so yes, that, that that definitely does help. And yeah, thank you for your question. Well, it is our two thirty, so we might wrap up. But I just wanted to again thank you, Steph, for sharing your journey. Your PhD and everything that's been happening with your life so far. We really appreciate the advice you've given. Um, and yeah, this is also being recorded. So, you know, we can share it far and wide and get your message out there. So if anyone's interested in taking up the opportunity to study like you, that um, they know what, what they're in for. Yes, and thank you for having me. Welcome. And thank you everyone for coming along and uh, we'll see you at the next one. <laughs>